Fantastic. All right, hello and welcome to our November 2022 virtual speaker series for the Philip J. Curry Dinosaur Museum. Uh, my name is Dr. Emily Banforth. I'm the museum curator here at the Curry Museum. Um, and I will also be your speaker for this evening. Uh, so if you have questions uh, during the presentation, you can type your questions into the chat on YouTube um, and I'll answer them after the presentation. Uh, my email is also there, evanforth at dynamuseum.ca, or you can also find me on Twitter and Instagram at el underscore banforth. So please feel free to use those if you have questions as well. So today we're going to talk a little bit about um, dinosaurs and birds. Of course, our American neighbors to the south today are celebrating Thanksgiving. So this seemed to be a, an appropriate time to talk about turkeys and, and other birds and how they relate to dinosaurs. Um, so we're going to start off this presentation with uh, a bit of a joke. Um, a second here. Give me two seconds here. My screen is just being a little uh, temperamental there. Oh. Sorry, technical difficulties. Just give me two seconds here. We'll try this one. Okay, there we go. Hopefully this will work better for us. Um, so we're going to uh, start our, our presentation off with a little joke. Why did the T-Rex cross the road? Answer, because it thought it was a chicken. Now, when I first heard this joke, I thought it was hilarious. And uh, by the end of this presentation, I'm hoping that you will also understand why this is actually kind of a funny joke, even without having to be a paleontologist. So uh, here's the mind-blowing fact for the day. Dinosaurs are actually not extinct. Now you might be thinking, wait a second, I know about that story of the giant asteroid that hit the planet about 66 million years ago and killed off the dinosaurs. Everybody knows about the dinosaur mass extinction. Well, truth be told, it was actually the non-avian dinosaurs that went extinct in that extinction. So the non-avian dinosaurs are the big ones like the Triceratops, the T-Rex, the Ankylosaurs, the duckbill dinosaurs, those are what we call non-avian dinosaurs. However, there is another branch of dinosaurs called the avian dinosaurs. These are our modern birds and all of the dinosaur ancestors that led up to modern birds. Avian dinosaurs did not go extinct at the Cretaceous mass extinction. They are still with us. Um, so dinosaurs technically didn't actually go extinct, or not all of them. So the next question we can ask, oh yeah, so non-avian dinosaurs, of course, now extinct, avian dinosaurs still with us. So one of the questions we can ask is, when did dinosaurs start being birds? Now we can actually answer this on two levels. So first on a kind of more of a societal or academic level, when did we understand that dinosaurs were birds? We can also ask it from a temporal or a geological point of view. When did dinosaurs start looking like birds? So the first way that we can answer this question is through what is called taxonomy. So taxonomy, it sounds like a fancy word. It is basically how biologists group organisms into groups. So how we make families and orders and phyla um, based on related organisms. So because Thanksgiving, be it American or Canadian, is a time for families, um, we're going to talk about taxonomy in terms of families. So here is, is an example of a human family from today. Um, so we've got Grandma Jones. Grandma Jones has got a son and a daughter, Adam and Amy. And Adam and Amy both have children, so Grandma Jones' grandchildren. So we can look at this family and we can say Grandma Jones and her kids and her grandkids these are all one family. So that is basically an ancestor and all of her descendants. But within this big family, there are subfamilies. So for example, we could say Amy and presumably her partner and her son would be a subfamily within that big family. What we cannot do, however, is pick and choose members of this family and group them together. So that, for example, if we did that, Grandma Jones and only her daughter and only two of her grandkids, this is not really a family or not a complete family. 
So these individuals are related, but we can't necessarily call this grouping a family because it leaves out members. So this is sort of how biologists use taxonomy as well, biologists and paleontologists. So let's look at the dinosaur family tree. Oh, so yeah, we can also not say this. So we can't just take the grandkids and say the grandkids are a family. We have to include them in their, um, you know, with their parents and their grandparents to be considered a, a complete family. So let's look at the dinosaur family tree. So just to give you a little bit of a background here. Um, so dinosaurs had an ancestor sometime back in the Triassic period. Um, and that dinosaur ancestor would have looked a little like a crocodile, a little like a dinosaur, something in between those two. Um, so this would be the ancestor of all dinosaurs. So from this ancestor, two groups kind of split off. The first group down at the bottom of the screen here were called the bird hip dinosaurs or the ornithischians. Um, so these are things like our horn dinosaurs, our duckbill dinosaurs, iguanodons, and chylosaurs. Basically, you can sort of think of them as all of the plant-eating dinosaurs except the sauropods, except the long necks. These are called our bird hip dinosaurs or ornithischians. So that was one group that split off. The other group that split off are what are called the saurischian or the lizard-hipped dinosaurs. Um, so this guy in the middle here, this is an example of an ancestral lizard-hipped dinosaur. You can see it's got a long neck, a little like those sauropods of those long neck dinosaurs, but this was also a carnivore. You can see it's got sharp teeth, it also had sharp claws. Um, so this particular animal is called a prosauropod. So the prosauropod group eventually split into two. One of those branches became the sauropods, those long neck dinosaurs. They grew to enormous sizes, things like Diplodocus and Brachiosaurus. Um, these are called the sauropods. The other group of saurischian ancestor evolved into the theropods. So theropods are all of our bipedal carnivorous dinosaurs. So things like T-Rex, the Velociraptor, um, Spinosaurus, all those, basically all the carnivorous dinosaurs you can think of are theropods. And birds came out of the theropod group. They basically evolved from theropod dinosaurs. So just like we did with our human family group, we can take, we can talk about different groups of dinosaurs or different families. Now for this exercise, I'm not going to use the term family because family is actually a taxonomic level. I'm just gonna use the generic term group. So if we look at these dinosaurs, we can look at all of them together and say, this is our dinosaur group. We have our dinosaur ancestor and all of its descendants. This is a complete group. Um, we can also look at subgroups within the dinosaurs. So for example, the theropods are a group, the theropods and the birds. So the ancestor and the descendants together, this makes the theropod group. However, what we cannot do is take birds and consider birds a group on their own because that excludes all of their ancestors. So technically, in a taxonomic sense, we have to call birds dinosaurs in order to include them in their um, kind of their big taxonomic group. And this, uh, this still, even though most of these groups are extinct, this still holds. Um, so birds are taxonomically dinosaurs uh, because they have a dinosaur, dinosaurian ancestor. So let's now look at what clues we have that birds are dinosaurs. So how did we first figure out that birds are descended from dinosaurs and that birds are in fact modern dinosaurs? So there's a number of different things that clued biologists and paleontologists into the fact that these two groups are not only related, but they are very closely related. So let's look at some of these examples. So the first and most obvious feature that unites birds and dinosaurs is the presence of feathers in our theropods. Again, theropods are those bipedal carnivorous dinosaurs. We now have hundreds of examples of dinosaur fossils that contain feathers, um, either in the sediment that's around them or in some cases in amber. So we have, there's a, a famous example of a dinosaur foot um, that actually has feathers coming out of it. So we know for sure that dinosaurs had feathers. And of course, birds have feathers today as well. Um, so some of the early birds, like Archaeopteryx, for example, in the top left there, would have been flyers. They would have been, we think, would have been using their, their, their wings for, sorry, their feathers for flight. However, most dinosaurs that had feathers were way too big to fly. So feathers evolved for a purpose other than flight. 
And paleontologists believe that the primary reason for feathers was actually display. So if you consider things like peacock with those big fancy tail feathers, those tail feathers don't actually help the peacock um, survive at all. They're actually a hindrance to survival. Those big tail feathers are um, for, for sexual display, for attracting mates. So we think the same was actually probably true of dinosaurs. They would have had these big fancy feathers um, to attract mates. Um, another reason they may have had feathers is that we now believe that theropods uh, were warm-blooded, like birds are today. So if you are warm-blooded, and particularly if you're a little smaller, having a layer of insulation to keep you warm is, is a very good thing. Um, so some feathers may also have been for insulation in dinosaurs. So feathers were really the very first clue that, that paleontologists and biologists had that dinosaurs and birds were related. Um, and the first feathered dinosaur that was ever found, the Archaeopteryx, was actually found in the 1800s. So we've known about feathered dinosaurs for quite some time. Another feature that unites birds and dinosaurs is scales. Now you may not think of birds as having scales, but if you look closely at their feet, in particular, um, birds have very dinosaurian like feet. So, for example, the foot of the ostrich up there, I mean, that's basically a dinosaur foot. Um, things like crows also have very dinosaurian feet. Um, perching birds um, base, um, have evolved like a backward facing claw so they can actually sit on branches. Dinosaurs didn't have that. Um, but birds today still have those scales on their feet. Um, and things like this is an example of a ptarmigan that has feathered feet. But on the bottom of their feet, you can see those scales. Um, and on the type top right there, that's an example of a dinosaur footprint where you can actually see the scales impressed in the mud. So it's an example of how we know the dinosaurs had scaly feet, just like birds. Another really important feature that unites birds and dinosaurs is hollow bones. Um, so particularly as paleontologists, when we're out in the field, we get really excited if we find a fossil bone that is hollow or that has big air holes in, in it. Um, so that middle picture on the top there, that's T-Rex bone. Um, and you can see it's got these really, really big honeycomb structures in it. Um, each one of those honeycombs is an air sac. These are basically hollow bones. Um, so birds today have hollow bones. If you've ever held a bird in your hand, uh, you'll know that they're very, very light animals. Even big birds like pelicans and swans and eagles are very light for their size. And that's largely because they have hollow bones. Um, so that's the top left there is an example of a human or a, a bird bone. Um, on the bottom left there, that's an example of a human bone versus an eagle bone. So an eagle bone is basically full of air. Um, so why did dinosaurs have light, have, have air-filled bones? Um, so we've already talked about the fact that most dinosaurs were too big to fly. So we know that they didn't have hollow bones so that, to make them light for flying. They had hollow bones for another reason. Um, and another conundrum that kind of um, confused paleontologists for a little while is that theropods, those bipedal carnivorous dinosaurs, have hollow bones. But the long neck sauropods, those really big things like Diplodocus and, and Brachiosaurus, also have hollow bones. Now that's a little bit of a, a head scratcher. Um, a hollow bones for something that is so gigantic obviously makes the body lighter. That's one of the reasons that we think that those big sauropod long neck dinosaurs could get so big is because they reduce their mass by having air filled bones. But there's another really important reason why we think some dinosaurs had air filled, had air sacs in their bones. Um, and it's actually a feature that also unites birds and dinosaurs, the presence of air sacs in the body. Um, so air sacs um, in birds and dinosaurs are actually a way to make respiration, make breathing very effect effective. Um, so as mammals, we breathe in and we breathe out. We, we cannot inhale and exhale at the same time. Um, so we, Basically, we have one cycle where we take air in, oxygen is exchanged, and we breathe out carbon dioxide. Birds and dinosaurs, and actually dinosaurs, evolved a way where they could breathe air in at the same time that they were exchanging air. Um, and the way they could do that is with, with extra air sacs, extra like places in their body that they could hold air. So in a bird and a dinosaur, uh, uh, they would breathe in, 
and fill their lungs. And as their lungs would fill in, the air sacs would be um, deflating. So basically you have a continuous sequence of air exchange. So unlike us where we have to breathe in and breathe out, um, birds and dinosaurs could exhale as they were inhaling. Um, so it basically made um, respiration very, very effective. Um, so you can see in the, the upper left corner, that's an example of a modern bird. Um, the air sacs are in blue, so you can see they're sort of distributed across the body. Um, this is one of the reasons why we think birds can do such crazy things like fly for days and days and days when, and not land on their migrations is because they have a very, very effective way of exchanging air. It's also the reason why some birds can fly over top of Mount Everest, um, even though the air up there is so, so thin. Um, they've got a very, very effective way of, of, res of respiring. Um, dinosaurs were kind of the same thing. Um, theropod dinosaurs, we think, had air sacs in their kind of their neck region. Um, those long neck dinosaurs would have actually stored air in their bones. Um, and that was a way, also one of the reasons they could get so big is because they were very effective at um, air exchange for getting oxygen to that huge, huge body. So air sacs are another very important feature that unite birds and dinosaurs. Another feature um, that some theropods have is what's called a swivel wrist. Uh, so if you look at those diagrams on the left there, um, that's a diagram of a raptor-like dinosaur, like if you think of a velociraptor or a Deinonychus. The one in the middle is an Archaeopteryx, an early bird, um, and the one on the far right there is a modern bird. So that swivel wrist is a feature that evolved in these um, small theropods, things like, like Velociraptor and Deinonychus and um, Dromaeosaurus, um, that basically allowed the dinosaur to kind of like flick its wrists inwards, um, probably for prey capture or some, something that has to do with catching and holding prey. Um, what's kind of cool is that that swivel it wrist feature eventually evolved into the flight stroke of birds. So if you watch a bird when it flies, they'll bring its wings forward and then flick the tip forward. That's basically the flight stroke. That flicking motion is actually done with the swivel wrist or the, the equivalent of the swivel wrist in a bird. That's the same feature that these um, small theropods, these dromaeosaurs and Deinonychus would have had, uh, would have evolved to actually catch or prey with. Um, so they used it for capturing prey. Birds eventually co-opted the same feature for flight. So the swivel wrist is also a, a uniting feature between small theropod dinosaurs and birds. Another thing that unites dinosaurs and birds, and this is probably one of the more obvious ones, is that dinosaurs lay eggs. Dinosaurs laid eggs in nests and incubated them the same way that a lot of modern birds do. Not all birds, but a lot of birds. Um, and this largely um, came by the discovery of a particular dinosaur called an oviraptor that lived in Asia. When the oviraptor was first found, this is an example of an oviraptor nest from Mongolia, um, they, it was assumed by the paleontologists at the time that that animal was stealing those eggs. Um, so that's what the word oviraptor means is egg thief. Um, so it was assumed that these were, di these were dinosaurs that were going in and stealing those eggs. It wasn't until they went in and actually looked at the inside of these eggs and looked at the embryos that they realized that the dinosaur that was on top of the eggs was the same as the dinosaur that was in the eggs. This was a parent dinosaur sitting on its nest, incubating its eggs uh, and incubating them when it died. That was basically died sitting on its nest. Um, and that was the first clue that we had that a lot of dinosaurs not only laid eggs in nests, but also incubated them. Um, and this is a behavior, of course, that still persists in modern day birds. Another feature that unites birds and dinosaurs, one that is not so obvious, is bipedalism, basically walking on two legs. Now, you might not think of birds as bipedal because, of course, birds have their forelimbs are, are modified into wings. Um, but if you think about it, they are bipedal. They rock around on two legs, um, particularly the ones that, that um, you know, live on the ground, especially things, you know, ostriches and emus, but also crows and pigeons and, um, you know, chickens, all those things walk around on two legs. Uh, that was a feature that evolved in dinosaurs. So all of our theropods, all of our bipedal carnivorous dinosaurs, bipedal being the, the operative word, walked around on two legs. 
Um, that was a feature that evolved very early in theropod dinosaurs. And again, it was because they walked around with two legs, the forelimbs were basically freed up to eventually become wings. Um, so bipedalism is another feature that birds and dinosaurs share. The wishbone is also a feature that first evolved in dinosaurs. And so if you've ever had a, a, a turkey dinner um, and uh, one of the traditions um, is to take that what's called the wishbone and snap it in half and whoever gets like the bigger chunk of the wishbone gets a wish. That's sort, sort of the kind of the tradition. The wishbone actually first evolved in dinosaurs and even things like T-Rex had a wishbone. Um, it's the fancy term for it is called a furcula. Um, it was basically united the, the two kind of shoulder blades of a dinosaur. Um, so even as far back as T-Rex, the wishbone existed. Um, birds have taken that bone and expanded it. It's now actually part of the flight stroke. So as the bird brings its wings in, the wishbone is contracted. Um, and, and then it pushes the wings back out again. So the bird is kind of helped in, in bringing its wings back out again. Um, so the wishbone has been co-opted to help in flight, um, but it was present in theropod dinosaurs as well. So this is a little bit of a um, less savory characteristic that unites birds and dinosaurs, but it's an important one. Birds and dinosaurs have what's called a cloaca. Um, so a cloaca, that's a Latin word that means sewer, basically. This is a single hole um, that kind of everything comes out of. So whether it's urine or feces or eggs, uh, this is also the hole that is used for mating. Um, basically, there's just one kind of um, external hole to the outside. Uh, this is something that unites birds and dinosaurs. Um, we basically don't know about dino a whole lot about dinosaur reproductive anatomy because everything was internal. There was kind of nothing that sort of hung out. Um, and so very little chance that that kind of thing is ever going to be fossilized. Um, but it's sort of the same thing with birds. Birds also don't have a lot of anatomy that kind of hangs out back there. Um, so this is another feature that that unites birds and dinosaurs. And actually that, that picture on the left uh, was actually kind of an amusing but an important scientific discovery that was made. Um, this is a Cetacrosaurus, kind of an early one of the horned dinosaurs, um, and was actually preserved with a very well-preserved cloaca. And this was one of the very first dinosaur cloacas that had been well-preserved. Um, so it was uh, kind of an important thing for, for paleontologists to be able to study. So one of the kind of the cutting edge um, aspects of science that is really starting to um, come out in terms of an important uniting feature between birds and dinosaurs is DNA. We are starting to realize that birds carry an awful lot of dinosaur DNA to the extent that if you go into a, a chick embryo, so a developing chicken, you can actually mess with its genes and make it express dinosaur characters. So for example, you can get chick embryos to grow teeth like a dinosaur. You can get chick embryos to grow hands instead of wings like a dinosaur. You can get chick embryos to grow a bony tail like a dinosaur. All of these genes still exist in modern birds, um, but they are now repressed during development. So um, the gene that expresses teeth, for example, um, in dinosaurs would have been expressed. In modern birds, there is a kind of a controller gene that represses that, that, that gene. So the bird no longer creates or, or grows teeth. Um, so we also now have an understanding that birds and crocodiles are way more closely related than we thought. Um, so if you go back to our sort of dinosaur family tree, remember the dinosaur ancestor was sort of crocodilian. The closest living ancestor to a modern bird is a crocodile. So dinosaurs kind of fill the gap between them. Um, but of course, birds still exist and dinosaurs still exist. So birds and dinosaurs actually have a lot of genes in common. Um, and so this is sort of kind of more cutting edge science that has allowed us to understand that there are some very, very close connections between birds and dinosaurs. And so with that, uh, the next time you sit down to enjoy a chicken or a turkey or a, a duck or a goose, um, consider the fact that you are actually eating a dinosaur. Um, and so with that, I will stop sharing my screen. Um, and if we have any questions in the chat, uh, let's go to the 
into here. Oh, okay. <laughs> that was... All right, so I don't see any questions here. Again, if you uh, if you do have questions about the presentation, uh, feel free to uh, email them or send them via social media. Uh, we're always definitely happy to um, to answer questions. Um, so again, this uh, this video will be up. Um, kind of inter in perpetuity in our virtual speaker series, um, part of our, our YouTube channel. Um, so please feel free to watch it again or invite uh, anyone who you think might be interested in watching it. And with that, uh, happy Thanksgiving, Americans, and, and happy Thursday, Canadians. Okay.